Folks, welcome to a special edition of the Jake Feinberg Show. And behind the washtub bases and the fretless kind, behind the tubas and any other instrument, is the individual who engages with that apparatus. The sound that emanates from this instrument can depend upon the proficiency of the player, their use of scales and notes. Mathematics are part of it. But ultimately, to be in a band, you have to have a gig. And to have a gig, you need to have soul. A collectivist mentality that as an accompanist, you're doing your job, making the leader sound as good as possible. My guest today came into his own when the musical spectrum was wide open. You had first-generation blues players who were experimenting with electric mud. You had younger male and female artists who were looking to turn back the hands of time, exploring jug band music and American folk music in more modern settings. My guest's musical career seems to have spanned several lifetimes, from Maria Muldaur to Bonnie Raitt, from Buddy Guy to Amos Garrett, from the cabins in Woodstock to the concrete jungle of Los Angeles. My guest has continually reinvented himself, adapting to the times and the changing dynamics of conveying authentic live music. He is a multi-instrumentalist, singer, songwriter, and producer, and it's an honor to have him on the program. Freebo, welcome to the Jake Feinberg hey, Show. Thank you, Jake. What, what a heck of an introduction. Yeah, well, it was, I, I wrote what, it up. What, 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 was that me you were talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Most of it's true, I think. I hope all of it's true. <laughs> you know, um... Freebo, it's funny, as I, as I keep digging, you know, like, I started out interviewing a lot of, uh, you know, ja- guys you might consider jazz musicians, but of course, as I continued to move through the, the paradigm of, of music, you know, I, I, I started to dive more into the, uh, to the blues, the acoustic blues, and then those who, you know, whether emulating is the right word or not, I mean, authentic white kids who were trying to emulate their heroes and I wanted to you to talk a little bit about you know where where you grew up and the kind of sounds that you were listening to uh, on the radio and and how you started to cultivate your own individual sound wow um, great question and uh, that's probably going to be a fairly long answer but, uh, <laughs> that's just fine yeah well it it all kind of uh I think it all kind of fits into uh, one of my favorite expressions. Uh, it's by John Lennon. He says, uh, life's what happens when you're busy making other plans. Mm-hmm. And uh, it all started with, you know, you start off as a kid not having any, any plans at all. Just growing up and you're trying to do what you're told to do. And, uh, I was uh, made to take piano lessons. Um, very grateful uh, to my mother. I thank her all the time. She's 98 years old. Unfortunately, she's still with us. Good. Uh, I know, yes, uh, of course. Go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, I, I mean, I, I have it in my collection for my for my two daughters right now. It's a great record. No, it's a wonderful record. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful yeah. music. And uh, the instruments come alive. And uh, for me, it was, because uh, uh, this was pretty, you know, I'm old enough. It was the days of very early television, certainly no music videos. And uh, you would listen. And when you, excuse me, when you listen to music, <coughs> your imagination. Which run wild, and particularly with classical music, because there's no lyrics. 
and uh, uh, I feel I, I got a, a, a nice, healthy dose of background of classical music, I think, and so a certain sense of melody and harmony and, uh, and, and, and intonation, because uh, the intonation in classical is very, very specific. It's, it's beautiful, obviously. A bunch of musicians who spend many hours a day learning their instruments and doing it, quote, right, which ultimately, when you do the kind of music we do now, you have to unlearn some of those rules, and I'll get into that a little bit later on. Um, there were also some uh, some Louis Armstrong stuff, uh, which they really liked. And so uh, he brought in the, the whole idea of, of New Orleans, because it was a bit of the New Orleans feel. Uh, the whole idea of Dixieland, which I really liked. And in the early Dixieland, there was a tuba. I was already into the sound of the tuba from Tubby the Tuba. Uh, I always liked bass. Maybe it was because of the... Uh, of Tubby the Tuba and, and, and hearing that part maybe it's because I'm a lefty <laughs> and so when I sit down the piano my left hand with my dominant hand and so it would focus on the, on the bass registers I'm not quite sure what it was but whatever it was I, um, I became very interested in the in the bass structure of music you know how the chord was changed by what the bass plays before I even played bass uh, or tuba so that was my early well plus the, my parents would go to we lived in a small town he's Pennsylvania, uh, and not, not a whole lot of culture there, uh, and, uh, but my parents, uh, fortunately, were, were well-educated. My mom came from Philadelphia, went to University of Pennsylvania, where they met, and so she would not only take us to, uh, to the city from time to time, uh, but, but she and my dad would go to a lot of those original uh, Broadway shows, like a lot of the Rodgers and Hammerstein shows, uh, Carousel, and... Uh, uh, and I, I remember actually, as a, I think as a teenager, uh, I went to the original uh, cast of, of West Side Story in New York, which is incredible. I got to see My Fair Lady, got to know all those kinds of music, and Carousel, Oklahoma, and, uh, South Pacific, wonderful music by Richard Rodgers. Uh, and uh, so you combine all that stuff with uh, then the early advent of rock and roll. Uh, I was, my brother was a teenager, I was a preteen, but I remember the first time I heard Little Richard and Chuck Berry uh, on the radio, and it just blew me away. It was such cool stuff, you know, big difference from, you know, Patty Page and Perry Como, <laughs> and uh, it, no disparagement to those, but uh, it was just a whole different type of music, and I had not been exposed to blues or rhythm and blues at all. So that was my first, uh, my first experience with that. So the early rock and roll came in and the beat and certain things that I, you know, really, you know, really got to like. Uh, my focus was not on being a musician. My focus being in this small Pennsylvania coal town uh, was to be a football player. Uh, so music was always on the side. It was never a priority. Uh, I could always hear it. I always liked it, but uh, it was nothing I ever, ever intended to do. I had uh, no aspirations. Can I, I've, you, you know, you've, you've, uh, just like so many other guys from your generation, you talk about that late fifties period, uh, little Richard and, um, Chuck Berry. I mean, those guys were, were incredible. Uh, uh, you know, the leadership back then was just really incredible. Um, so those, those names continue to pop up, but one thing that you said, well, let's just get this straight. It was it a deer hunter kind of town that you came from. It was what? Like a deer hunter, you know that movie? Well, that's Western Pennsylvania, but this is, but, but it's, yeah, exactly the same kind of town. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And and I think one thing I wanted to ask you about because I find that this is one of those things that, uh, you know, the the when you went to see the original West Side Story, how special and and I, I tend to feel like this is uh, the energy that was palpable back then is that you had live people uh, playing in the orchestra I mean you had live people playing this stuff timpanis and they were playing bass and even if you went to see Charlie Brown on on on, uh, on Broadway it was live people same thing with the Tonight Show Hollywood uh, uh, soundtracks I mean the idea that there was real people playing this music made it swing so hard. And I was—I wonder if that resonated with you at that time as well. Well, I didn't think of it that way because obviously I had nothing to compare it against, but uh, the, the sound of the music uh, was, was really incredible. Uh, you know, the pit bands, the pit orchestras, uh, the, the live singing, 
What 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 what, what I, position did you play? Uh, we, I, we played both ways. I was a fullback on offense and a safety on defense. Wow! So you you really liked it. You were a hitter. I mean, you were a hitter. What's that? You were a hitter. It, well, you had to be. It, it was it was a hard nosed time. It was a hard nosed time, and uh, so that's the way I uh, I defined myself. But like I said, I had this whole sensitive side going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I borrowed 
I want to slow. Wait, I, I, you're, 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 I want to slow, slow down. This is way. There's so much going on here. Um, I'm just giving you the whole story to get a perspective. I mean, this is this is heavy stuff. So, um, what year did you go uh, to Germany? What year? About what year? That was 1964, 65. Right. So, okay. So 64 and 65, and you left. I, I, you know, I, I'm curious to get your take. On the the early '60s, you had uh, you had Elvis went to the army. Uh, little Richard, I think, found God, and then uh, th there was. Yeah, when little Richard found God. Yeah, well, the, tw the later you know better than I, but but the point is that the early '60s. Uh, what what was your view of of music? The was there a lot of good music going on? You just had to seek it out. I mean, I've asked a lot of the guys about because then there was. Well, I, go ahead. I, I always felt like in the top ten. Uh, I remember even being uh, up in uh, up in the Poconos at that camp as a waiter and listening to we could get WABC, I believe it was. Yeah. Look, and they had, I guess, they had a top ten. I think Cousin Brucey was on that, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and uh, I remember hearing the top ten, you know, throughout the years, and I never never liked more than two or three songs on it. On the top ten, I mean, there's, there's, look, there's been a lot of crap commercially on TV and in movies and music, uh, but somehow the cream always finds its way to the top, and, and it's what it's what stays with us. We forget about the lousy stuff because we don't keep hearing it for the most part. Um, but uh, I do remember, particularly, I mean, I remember the Little Richard stuff. I, I don't remember the charts, but I, must, I heard it a lot, so it must have been on the charts and the Chuck Berry stuff. And, uh, you know, and then, and then, you know, some of the real soulful stuff that, uh, that came in, uh, obviously the Motown stuff in the latter part, well, I guess the mid-60s, in that area, era, which was really cool. Uh, and I, of course, when the Beatles came in, I guess that was 64, so the Beatles were already happening when I was in Germany. Uh, I guess starting to, yeah, exactly, I think they came in, what, 62 or 63? And, and that was amazing, because in terms of the top 10, now you've had between the Beatles and the Stones, Dave Clark Club, now you have seven, eight, nine out of the top ten songs that were really good, mm -hmm. really liked. And that's when the songs started taking on a different, as far as the songwriting, um, taking on a different thing in terms of singer songwriting. Certainly the Beatles had a lot to do with that. Uh, I'm trying to think of who is it. Jackie Wilson. I remember Jackie Wilson came in. I mean, you know, incredible singing. So that you have all these different influences coming in. You had you had the black, you had the white, you had the British, uh, and and all the different all the different elements, you know, that ultimately comprise rock and roll. There's blues, there's the blues, uh, there's some country, there's some mountain. Uh, it's basically American music, really. You know, um, I wanted to ask you: Did you when you went back to to U Penn? Uh, did you get to go to the Earl Theater at all? Did you get to check out some of these older venues where there would be these, you know, late night jam sessions? You might see Reggie Workman or all these other jazz cats. I mean, were you? Did you? Did you get a taste of that? Where was that one again? It was a place called the Earl Theater. The Earl Theater. Yeah, it was an old, and I'm I'm not sure when it closed, but. One of these places that you know Donald Bailey and 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 uh, Reggie Workman and Mickey Roker and all these. Phil I mean, Philadelphia is so rich with the soul and the and the jazz. I'm just trying to n figure Absolutely. out trying to figure out what what uh, what 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 you were going to see if you were going to see you know in your spare time if you, what what kind of music you would you would check out, uh, especially uh, when it came to the like the like you said the well, Af African jazz. Honestly, Jake, I I was so ensconced in, in, in my own thing and in trying to combination to figure out who I was. Uh, we had to, because um, at this point with Edison Electric, we about 66. Right. So that's really when my, my, my earlier experience at Swarthmore College was in like in 62, 63, 64, before I went over to uh, Germany. At that point, I wasn't at all into music. I was just trying to, you know, make it academically and play football and find myself and I didn't even have a guitar. So it wasn't until I went to Germany with Jerry in 64, 65 that I really started getting into, you know, that kind of music. And, and even there, now listening, but now, now 
So basically, you were a hybrid Freebo, and 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 what? And to me, whether you want to call it a master of all trades or a jack of all trades, it seems to me that because of these influences that you were hearing, Muddy Waters and Young Bloods and 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 the Dead and and the, you know the early the legal psychedelic uh, jam scene was really pretty amazing. And, Absolutely. And and and. Uh, so I mean, you get back, you get back to UPenn, and you're right in it, and 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 I guess I just sort of tripped out for a minute. But what was that? What was the band that you guys put together in in Philadelphia that that you opened for Big Brother in that? I, I had no idea about that. So go tell oh, yeah. me. It was, it was called the Edison Electric Band. Yes, there's an album. You put an out. There's an album out. I have to find that vinyl. Exactly. Yeah. It's called Bless Bless You, Doctor Woodward. Yes. <laughs> Was he like a professor, a politician of some sort? I'm not sure who he was. Yeah, he. Sh- I mean, there should have been more people speaking out about that at that time. Well, there should have been. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's just so ridiculous. But that, that's that's the subject. <laughs> that's another. Time. Yeah. So I mean, the the idea that you took all these influences and that band, so this band formed, and what was the instrumentation like, and how would you describe the sound? It was a four piece band for the most part. At one point, we had a lead singer, and then um, we dropped him. It was uh, uh, Mark Jordan. Uh, who still plays in Nashville, uh, Mark T. Jordan, wow. uh, played uh, keyboards. Uh, for most of He's also a good guitar player, but he played keyboards and sang and uh, uh, did the writing, did the musical writing. And uh, Dave Stop, Stock, Rip, Rip Stock was a drummer and he did a lot of the lyrics. Uh, I didn't write at all at that point. I had no interest in doing it. Uh, I just played bass and that was good enough for me. And uh, then we had a guitar player uh, we later replaced with a guy named T.J. Tyndall. And uh, it's interesting, Dan, when we broke up, I went off with Bonnie, and uh, Mark Jordan went off with Van Morrison, and T.J. Tyndall uh, started doing sessions with Gamble and Huff and played on um, on a lot of the stuff like the OJs. He played on the Love Train. Wow, the Sigma Jordan. Sound, he, all the Sigma Sound stuff. That's really unbelievable. Yeah, all wow. the Sigma Sound wow, stuff. Wow, wow, exactly. wow, wow. So it, it, it was a pretty good band. We had a lot of, you know, we, we had, there was a lot of talent in the band, and we made a decent record. I, I look back on it, and she'd be nice to <laughs> make it again with what we know now, but uh, it, it all happens in its proper time. How, how did, how did uh, like, uh, you got to give me a little bit of background. Was it an independent record label? How did you get picked up? No, it was Atlantic. It was Atlantic. Okay. It was Atlantic, but it actually Cotillion, which was one of the... Uh, oh, I love Cotillion. They had some wild stuff on Cotillion. And 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 if you could, I mean, so you had a guy. You you went off with Bonnie. Um, uh, your one soul brother went off with more Van Morrison. Another one went off with the Sigma Sound. Um, are you? Can we? Can we possibly pigeonhole this music, or how would you? Was it? Was it? Well, I would say the type of music that we played. We were a funky, psychedelic, original blues band. Oh, right up my alley. So, right up. <laughs> so it was. It was coming from. From blues, but it was a blues band, and uh, it was psychedelic. And then we, we we were certainly one of the early jam bands, and uh, and we're particularly funky. And that that was a Philadelphia thing, you know. That's probably where Philadelphia made its mark the most on me and on the band. I really liked funky music. I liked a lot of syncopation. I loved doing that, and uh, and we did we we did a lot of that. So. Our songs were like, say, it was a funky, psychedelic blues band, you know, original music and some interesting stuff, some nice chord changes. And, uh, uh, you know, we made a bit of a name for ourselves and we got to open up for these folks. Of course, that's how I met Bobby. Uh, yeah, no, I'm curious about, I'm curious about the, um, with Atlantic, how it worked with, like, if you, you made an album with Atlantic and then would you, would that automatically get you an opportunity to get on the radio once in a while. I mean, how did they? How did the, those? How did you get paired up with those with those groups? Was there a conduit to it? You mean how did we open for them? Exactly. Uh, well, we we played the local uh, politics uh, diplomacy game. Sure. Uh, there's a place called the Electric Factory. Uh huh. Still, elect- still Electric Factory concerts in uh, in Philadelphia, but the Electric Factory was the uh, psychedelic dungeon. And each <laughs> town had it. New York had the Electric Circus, and then had 
the Fillmore, and uh, I think Boston had the Boston Tea Party, and, and of course San Francisco had the Carousel, and all of these wonderful places. Um, we, uh, you know, we would lobby uh, to get these spots. You know, the dead would be coming in, Jimi Hendrix, uh, you know, the Doors, uh, Big Brother. I mean, uh, a lot of these bands would come in. You know, not part of the circuit, and there were, you know, five, six, you know, Philadelphia bands of our caliber who uh, all of whom lobbied to get these gigs. It was a prestige gig to get you finally get in front of people and uh, in front of an audience who's really going to be listening with the light show and the whole thing. Uh, so we, we did that and, and in terms of the dead and uh, Big Brother, it also allowed us when we went out to San Francisco the summer of 68, uh, we opened uh, for Big Brother uh, twice. Wow. Once in the Carousel Ballroom oh, and wow. uh, oh. once at the, uh, in Golden Gate Park. And we did another thing where we opened for the dead in Golden Gate Park. So, you know, we kind of got to know those guys, but particularly Big Brother. We became actually very friendly with Sam Andrews in Big Brother. He was a big, big fan of the band. He just loved what we did musically. What, what did you... Um I was going to ask you uh, th this idea. You know, I'm, I'm through my research. The idea of developing your own uh, unique. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, your 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 parents may never have told you this directly, but it's kind of like you can comp all the. You can listen to all the, the classical music, and you can copy that, and you can listen to how the tuba was the bass line in Dixieland. But ultimately, it's like, what is Freebo? What, what, what's he going to? What does he have? His, what's his individual sound? And I, I tend to think that's that you guys, I mean, just looking across the spectrum of, of, of musicians uh, from this time, it seems to me that this the, it seemed so innocent. And maybe you guys took it for granted to a degree, but it's like the amount of times that you were able to get up in live settings where the audience was either completely engaged or maybe they were out of their minds. But the point is that you were able to get up and and uh, prior to one of these really big name bands and do it so many times that you became so secure with yourself that that's where ultimately you became completely free and 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 there was sp spontaneity it wasn't not everything was there was nothing really planned out maybe you went through some sketches or some ch you know but to me it was it was there was a looseness to it and because of the opportunities to be able to play a, uh, next to big brother or some of these other big name, it must have been invigorating and it must have helped you uh, get your own ind individuality. That's uh, that, that that's what I, my research has pointed to, but I, I'd like you to talk about that a little bit. Well, it, it, it's, it's, that's a good point, and, and, uh, and we did. It was a special time. It was a time uh, and a place where people did listen to the music. Uh, maybe it was the drugs, maybe it was the change. It was happening uh, sociologically. I'm not sure. Probably a combination of both. Uh, and a change was happening musically, where it kind of went from AM to FM, uh, from from above ground to what we call underground at the time, uh, to where you had four minute songs into fourteen minute songs, and uh, we were we were, we were right in the middle of that, and uh, we liked to jam. Um, I think one of the things that really helped us uh, and helped me was in the beginning, uh, a couple of the guys in the band kept saying, "No, oh, we're an original band. We play original music." don't want to do covers. If they do covers, it would be a Paul Butterfield song or a Bird Grateful Dead song or a Jefferson Airplane song, something like that. But right. they didn't want to do any top 40. The truth is, I wanted to play some bars occasionally, make some money, to play some of the cover tunes, and just get better as a band, which I did many years later. But in retrospect, I'm so glad that they did this because it kind of kept us pure. And it allowed us to, as me in particular, uh, allowed me to explore. Uh, I could still pick up licks from, from the commercial stuff I'd hear from uh, James Jamerson, you know, from Motown on bass, or Ronnie Baker from the Philadelphia Sound, or uh, Chuck Rainey with Reese Franklin. I mean, so many great <laughs> bass players, and then even stuff from uh, Jack Cassidy, you know, in, uh, in the airplane. And, uh, and, and Phil Lash in the dead, I mean, uh, Phil Lash is very interesting.
and a huge uh, and a like huge uh, a huge uh, like yourself. I mean, a huge classical background for Phil. Um, and and yeah, exactly. I I, I look. Yeah, he was exactly. I mean, the it's just funny you you bring it's funny you bring him up because I actually wanted to talk about uh, another guy. Uh, well, what's really great is that uh, I'm interviewing uh, Chuck Rainey of doing a four part part series with Chuck, uh, and and you mentioned two guys, uh, James Jamerson and Chuck Rainey, and those guys. I, I mean, you know. What amazing people to to be hearing on the radio and to be able to emulate. You had the, I'm, I'm not going to call them role models, but just people that you were able to just sort of listen to and say, wow, they're, they're doing different stuff. They're not just, they're, they're, they're deep in the pot, pocket, but they're also playing really heavy chords. And the guy that, that comes to mind, I'm sure you crossed paths with him, but uh, is John Kahn. John Kahn was, this, was just this, he was obsessed with James Jamerson. Yeah, well, I, I knew John Conn a bit because I met him. Uh, I love to met him through Maria. I, I think I might have met him previously, maybe through Jerry Garcia. Uh, but uh, no, I actually Chuck, Chuck Rainey and uh, and James Jamerson. Uh, I would say talk about idols. You know, really were idols of mine. No. Once I got into they, they were bass playing idols of mine, and uh, I can't say I tried to be them, but I certainly did everything I could to pick up what I could from both Chuck Rainey and James Jamerson. What was interesting is I remember whenever I try and play like them, it would still come out like me. (laughs) Yeah, but that's cool, though. That's cool. Well, at first it bothered me, but after a while I I came to realize that, well, that's what individuality is all about. You know, it it comes out sounding like me, and if if people like it, and ultimately if I do, if I get out of my own way, I'm my own critic. So, I definitely, and you're right, they're both very melodic bass players. They both knew the chords, and you have to know the chord, what's going on with the bass, because you don't just, in a C chord, you don't just play a C, you can play an E, you can play a G. You've got to know what, what the chord's made up of, and, uh, and that allows you to make choices and become interesting choices. And then, of course, you have the rhythmical choices. Both these guys were incredibly rhythmical. But rhythmical in the way where they didn't just play the downbeat, or they played all sorts of syncopated stuff. And they played their wonderful ensemble players. They played around with everything else was happening. So uh, for me as a bass player, uh, they were wonderful role models in terms of how to do it. And of course, you get somebody like Paul McCartney who comes along and plays his uh, beautifully melodic bass, of course, around songs that he's written. So there, there's, there's so many different styles. Uh, like, like I said earlier, Jake, I mean, I'm an American hybrid. That, that's what I am. You have to know that's the perfect I, name I for you. Myself. It's the perfect name for you. I mean, you you are a you, you're a you know you're fusing all this stuff together. But yet, you know, in some ways, Freebo, um, what, what what's what's powerful? What you said, it's so true. It's like uh, I, I also think that that it doesn't matter if it was Peter Rowan or you know David Grisman or Jerry Garcia or you know. Any 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 of these guys, even jazzers, you know, it was like we are an original band. Like origi- right. originality was so individualism was so important because it, it gave identity. And you know, I'm reading. A, you know, you can read all the Norman Mailer you want, and you can read all this. And I'm and I'm just beginning to sort of tap into the literature. And there was this sort of this this drag towards conformity. And I look at it in the music scene as well. And I, I, my question for you is: We talked a little bit about you going on your, your current trips, musical adventures, and you know how do you continue to be authentic and to be original? I just think that it is so important because, just for my generation, I mean, I'm you know I was born in in 1978, so it's like I just see so much le- le- lethargic sort of repetition and sort of copycatting. Um, you don't really hear a lot. I, I'm, I'm waiting for that new crop of, of Dizzy Gillespie's and Mick Jagger's and sort of, but I just, I don't, I don't know, but that, I just feel like that drag towards conformity has been stifling and I just wonder how you tend to overcome it. You do have that Philadelphia can-do style. I mean, I got a bunch of friends who live in Cherry Hill and we always would drive over the Ben Franklin Bridge and just being in Philadelphia was just it's still an electric time. So you have that can-do mentality, but how have you continued from the times of 
uh, Woodward to now, how have you kept that originality in your in your ethos? Well, I, I'll, that'll drive me a little bit into politics, but that's all right. Uh, oh, absolutely. No, first of all, the '60s were a time of breaking through. It was a time of breaking out of the mold of the guy I had to, at such and such, such and such an age, became an adult. You would put on a coat and tie. You would do this. You would do that. Uh, you would. You would. You would work in and be part of the system. Uh, our whole thing was about breaking away from the system. Uh, uh, and you know, and honestly, drugs helped do that. Helped it helped open our eyes to a whole different reality. Uh, obviously, you can't stay there. Uh, every <laughs> every curve has an apex. Personally, I went a little bit past the apex, but <laughs> I've, been, I've, been so, I've been sober for the last 21 years, mm. and uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the, uh, the lessons that I did get out of that time. And, uh, and it did help turn my head around from that straight mm. kid growing up in, 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 in uh, like say, in uh, deer hunter country, Pennsylvania, to coming into the 60s, being in the University of Pennsylvania at that time, the height of the Vietnam War, the height of the counterculture, and a time when it was all about originality. Musically, it was about originality. I was right there. So I think that helped turn my head around. And I would go back uh, to some a little, a, an amazing book that I, that I, I keep rereading, is uh, People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. Yeah, I know. Um, it's 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 uh, My cousin wrote The People's History of Science, and Zinn... Uh, uh, it didn't edit the book, but he he reviewed it for my cousin. It's it's another book you would love to read, but I know what you yeah I know what you're saying. Go ahead, continue. Well, the, the, and the point of the people's history of the United States is that the system has always been that way. The system has always been one of conformity. The system has always been one to make you be part of the system and set up the illusion uh, and a, a small truth, but. Uh, the illusion that you too can achieve the American dream. The illusion is that everybody believes they can, and now you see the result of it now where most people are working two, three jobs for several people in the family, and except for the occasional person who makes it to the NBA or rap or becomes a Bill Gates and events to whatever. But it, it's very corporate. It's all about following suit. You listen to the music, you look at American Idol, uh, The Voice, uh, all the stuff that's on, it's very similar. And so in order to make it in this world, you have to think outside in, which is, what do they want? What do I have to do to conform to the system? To, <laughs> that's uh, right. that's to exactly something right. something that will be accepted, that will mm. make me the money, that will ultimately get me the stuff that will make me happy. And uh, I, I learned, and I've been learning along the way, that it doesn't work that way. It's not outside in, it's inside out. It's all about an inside job. And, and it's about what I have to do get my inner strength, call it spiritual, call it emotional health, call it whatever, call it originality, uh, and also call it just knowing, knowing yourself, to thine own self be true, right? Uh, and somehow along the way, uh, all these different uh, pieces of my history and elements have helped me to get to that point so that uh, what I'm doing now is doing my own music as part of this, like you said, this transition to reinvention. Uh, to me, it's really just part of the same trip. It, it, it's what I was meant to come to. All these elements that I've heard all the way along, whether they be the, the, the show tunes, the Beethoven, the Stravinsky, the Louis Armstrong, the Little Richard, Bob Dylan, Joni Mitchell, Jimi Hendrix, James Taylor, uh, and, and that other world that I wound up in with Bonnie Raitt in, in the 70s singer-songwriter thing, when I wasn't writing songs, now that I'm writing songs, after I made a conscious decision to do that in my 40s, all of these elements are coming into my music. And the idea of having been around in the 60s and, and, and knowing who you are and, and finding who you are first and knowing who you are and coming from that place allows me to write the kind of songs that are songs from my heart, from my spirit, that somehow uh, evoke a certain truth that, that I see, whether it be in love or in politics or about a homeless person, uh, and I can now take that truth lyrically and, and, and write it hopefully in some sort of poetic, uh, evocative way, and then surround it with music that adds a, another emotional element uh, to what's being stated lyrically. Put it all together with with the hybrid, the, with the musical hybrid that I am, taking all the production ideas, 
and I've always had putting my bass part to it along with my acoustic guitar part, uh, getting uh, musicians from all these different genres, and I'm fortunate enough to know who are really great players, finding the right player for the right song, and putting all these pieces together into my records. And so it's coming out being, being my music, and the fact that it's accepted um, and continues to grow and continues to make me happy, which is the bottom line. It just brings, brings me joy, and if it brings me joy, there's a better chance of bringing you some joy. So the whole process has been really incredible over the last, gosh, what, 45 years or so, you know, getting close to, close to half a century. And um, I'm just grateful that you know, I happen to find this, like I said, you know, I was <coughs> no, I was gonna, no. I mean, it, it's it's. I think what what I don't what bothers me, and again, I, it's it's hard to get. To, you've been around longer, and you have perspective. Um, you've seen these cycles. Uh, you, we've cycled through this stuff before, but there's something about the idea of this late '60s. Um, uh, you know, this this breaking away from conformity, wanting to be individualistic. Um, it, it was more visceral. I mean, it was in your face in the sense that, it, you know, people were out sort of demagoguing you or pointing to you and, and, and you guys were basically standing up and using your music as freedom of expression. And, and now I just see it's we're, it, we live in a more punitive society now where if you don't conform, uh, th there's, there's hysteria because of cultural changes and more diversity. But it just seems to me that if you don't fall into line, the, the punishments are much more severe now. Whereas before, there was, I don't want to say ragtag element, but it was just, there was a underground element that was strong. And, and there were guys like Bill Graham and, and John Schur and, and, and all sorts of independent, I mean, I can't even imagine the idea of the freedom of the AM radio stations being run by college DJs uh, being being able to play whatever they wanted to all over the airwaves and talking about stuff too, having like making it local. That's what Kuskuna and I were talking about is that radio was always meant to be local and topical and so that communities could build. And now it's just one long infomercial. And the well, but you see, but that, that, that's just that's just the corporatization of America. That's exactly what. That's so what I what I'm saying is, has it? it, it, it it's, yeah. it's political, Jake. It's totally political, and it is you know socio political economics, and uh, the fact that the monopoly laws have, have pretty much just you know broken away into almost nothing. And right. One corporation buys another, buys another. So, I mean, is it right that Clear Channel can own something like fifteen hundred radio stations? Therefore, they put their uh, con consultant on. They say, well, we find that the demographic, uh, if we play a combination of this song, this song, this song, this is where we'll get the most listeners. So by definition, you're, you're going to the least common denominator. You've got to try and get the most folks you can to listen. So you're not trying to educate folks. You're not trying to do, you're going outside in. You're not going inside out. The inside out is what this girl is talking about. The inside out is what you're talking about, where you, you know what, I got this radio station, I'm a college DJ, by the way, it was FM, not AM, right. um, and, and I'm a DJ, and I can play whatever the heck I want. Let me let me turn you on to some good stuff, I will take my job seriously, I'll find all the stuff that's coming out, and dig this, sit back, listen, and enjoy. That's my favorite kind of disc jockey, they hardly exist anymore. Hardly. Just really sad. Talk about, there were disc jockeys, and I've talked to so many guys, you know, there was, uh, I can never remember the guy's name, but I mean, the signal would carry from New Hampshire all the way down to Delaware on a clear night, and, and, and you know, he, the guy would get up and say, yeah, we're going to listen to, it was like midnight, and he's like, we're going to listen to six hours of Thelonious Monk right now. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I guess what, what it comes down to is... Um, uh, and I don't want to come across as naive. I don't consider myself naive. But is it is it is this a uh, flat out uh, nefarious attempt to dumb down society, or do people really, or do people just say no? That's capitalism. It's what we believe in, and if it's egregiously overwhelming, so be it. I mean, I'm trying to. No, no, no. That's that, no, that, that, that's the narrative that they're told to believe is capitalism, and that's good. Right. Okay, so now I'm not I'm not uh, putting down capitalism per se, uh, in political discussion for another day, but uh, or, or espousing communism. But what's happened is with with unlimited capitalism, you wind up with 
uh, what you want with exactly what's going on. Exactly. One one percent of the population owns, you know, over fifty percent of everything, the money, and so the other ninety nine percent of the people you know, are left with the other fifty percent. And it turns out that after you get past the first ten percent, the other ninety percent are left with something like about twenty percent. So it, it, it's kind of like playing a monopoly game. And everybody starts more or less equal, although they didn't because the landowners <laughs> took, you know, took it from the beginning. But everybody starts equal after a while with the luck of the dice or whatever. Some people land on the properties to get the houses, hotels. By the end of the game, you're left with just having to land on other people's houses and hotels, pay the rent, and and maybe land on chance occasionally. And then pass go and collect your $200. <laughs> most, people are doing, most people are passing go collecting their two hundred dollars and they don't have a choice and yes they've been dumbed down and that's and that's the whole narrative they've been dumbed down and now what do they have oh you have legalized gold that's right i can play the lottery oh my god what will i do with 133 million dollars so now everybody's going in and playing the lottery hoping they'll win there a legalized gambling in other places so you've got this whole illusion set up and it's all based around being part of the system uh, and, and so there just isn't the same originality. And the, uh, the other difference, I think, too, Jake, is that part of what uh, caused the 60s to happen, it was an, influence, uh, an interesting confluence of influences and energies. And, and the, the Vietnam War had a lot to do with that, and the fact that there was a draft had a lot to do with that. There's no draft now. And so for most people, they don't have a personal stake, and they don't even know anybody who has a personal stake. In being sent to Iraq or Afghanistan, mm-hmm. or getting killed, or coming back and being maimed, all they see is the result of the homeless person on the street. And in most cases, it's not even compassion for that person. Just ah, oh, get a job. And uh, so I think it's become a very selfish society. And most of the news of what you watch, it's all corporate. They're all owned by two or three or four corporations. That's it. And they're the same corporations that own the stuff that they sell. And, uh, and so you're not going to hear any negative feedback. And all the experts who are brought on are experts who just espouse the point of view of the, you know, of the status quo. Right. And so, that's one of the reasons I, one of the reasons I started my show, uh, as you know, originally on AM and now in a podcast form, but I, I do stuff for uh, freelance stuff for, for NPR as well. And, 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 and it's because I think at the core I'm tired of listening to politicians who are, you know, I mean, you got 20% of them are millionaires now and lawyers and pundits. 20% of almost all of them are millionaires. Yeah, I could, uh, maybe 20% of the house. I'm not exactly sure. There's, but, uh, but maybe it's more than that. But the, but the idea is that it's, you know, I walked away from, I just find it very demeaning now also because you can go into certain fields uh, like teaching or special education, you know, I was a teacher of the visually impaired for eight years and it's like, uh, you know, I, it, 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 it just seemed so, so, it's so transparent how, how broken the system was where you, uh, you, you don't even have the ability to, uh, you know, it, it, you're at the whims of the state, you know, you're in a right to work state and they, if they don't want to give you a raise for eight to 10 years, so be it. I mean, and, and I'm just like, that's, I went back to get a master's degree. I know I'm a bright dude, and I and actually I believe very much in society. And I, you know, but this to me is you're going to see, and I'm already seeing it is sort of this um, breaking away from uh, this. La- I don't even think it's conformity because conformity to me means that if you get in line, you're going to be rewarded. And like you said, you basically have to be, you know, uh, an all 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 encompassing athlete or. Uh, you know, some, some swift foreign, uh, you know, international relations person, but by and large conformity now just means you, you, you work a job and if, if you get shafted, so be it. I, 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 my, my theory, my, my question for you is what was in place or what, how did you guys overcome that, um, the, the corporations were just not, they were entrenched, but not as entrenched, specifically the late 60s and early 70s. When you met up with Bonnie and Maria and you guys were going to, you know, I'm looking at these shows like University of New Haven, you were playing college campuses. I mean, was, how did you overcome that that corporatization if it was at, at that time? Well, I was, I was lucky. Uh, I, I, I didn't overcome anything. If you really look at it, uh, I was, in a way, uh, once I started playing with Bonnie, I was part of that. Bonnie had a record uh, contract with Warner Brothers. And so Warner Brothers uh, paid her to make records. Again, 
gave her the, uh, you know, from the budget and, and put the machinery behind her. Uh, and it was a time when uh, they would put you on tour and you'd play at the Troubadour for a week and you'd play at the, uh, the Second Fret or uh, the Main Point or uh, the Cellar Door in D.C. or Max of Kansas City. You'd play for a week and you'd open up for somebody who was already pretty popular. And so you'd get the exposure. It was all part of the machinery that put you out there that helped sell records and help get people come to the gig. So I was a paid employee. Uh, so she made the money from that uh, part of the musical corporate scene, and I was an employee. Uh, it worked for me uh, for a while. And uh, when I stopped doing that, uh, I mean, I've, I've had gigs over the, you know, over several different decades, but I think what finally got me to start doing my own music was I, I basically got sick and tired of being an employee of somebody. Uh, it, partly being at their whim, but really mostly because I put, put, put my musical ideas into it. So again, a confluence of influences and circumstances uh, drove me to, quote, reinvent myself, to do something else, which was make my own music, be my own boss, take my own chances. Uh, and fortunately, what's happened along the way, and it probably has something to do with, it, with, with what I'm doing now, had a lot to do with it, is that the music industry has changed and it, it has imploded uh, with good reason because it, it really took advantage of a lot of folks. There's some, you know, a myriad of horror stories. Oh, it's horror. Yeah, no, it's a tragedy. Get paid. I, I, I've known people who made the record of their lives, a record they've been, it, that have been uh, incubating for, for many, many, many years and they finally make their record. The record company pays for it. They have their record deal. They're really excited. And then the guy who signed them to the deal uh, moved to a different company. And another guy comes in, and lo and behold, their record doesn't get released because the record company has the right to do that. It gets shelved, and they now they 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 can't even re-record those songs because that's part of the contract. So it's kind of an indentured servant. And to have watched that implode doesn't make me sad. It doesn't mean there weren't some good people in the record business. There was definitely a lot of good ones, but there were. You know, some real scalawags. So what's interesting has happened now is with the advent of the CD and the fact that you can make your own CD, you can manufacture your own CD, uh, you can record your own music on digital recording so you don't have to spend $100,000, $150,000. You don't have to use somebody else's lathe to cut the record. You can now write your song, uh, find a way to produce, record the song, produce the song, Put it out on your CD, sell them, you know, person to person, go to the CD Baby, the different uh, outlets. So now, in terms of freedom, in a way, uh, there's actually more freedom for the musician than there's ever been. It's a lot of work. I mean, I pretty much do it by myself. I don't have a, a big, big machinery behind me. But I do have the freedom to do what I want, and I can create my audience. I can create my product. And uh, I can create a, a method of marketing that works and gets my music out there somehow. You know, so, I, in I, a way, that's, that, that's very freeing. And if I can make enough money to pay for my food, clothing, and shelter, and rent, etc., uh, I'm a happy guy. No, I, you know, I, I, and I think you've, you've figured it out, but I think that part of this sort of self-discovery for me is the idea of looking and seeing the... Um, you know, the, 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 there was a real record industry uh, when you were, you know, first coming in. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i looking at this Edison record, and it's, I mean, you, you can't get this for under 45, 50 bucks. It's a, bi it's a big record. But the point is that, uh, you know, the Gollywogs. Excuse uh, me a second. That's true. You can't get it for 45, 50 bucks. I mean, you can get a CD, but I don't collect CDs. I only get vinyl. I'm the record. So how, how, come, how come I'm not even getting... Yeah, the, well, exactly. No, I mean, <laughs> I you, that's it. You know, that's, <laughs> that's right. And, and <laughs> you know, in some ways, um, having that individual, uh, you know, you being your own boss, you have you know copyright, and you have you can share in that now. Uh, but you know, it's it's the pictures, Freebo. It's the liner notes. It's the actual warm sound of the record it's the it's the idea that it looked like you guys were having a lot of fun whereas today 
Okay, Freebo does a, a piece of music, and you go on to iTunes, and you could download one song for 99 cents, but you, you don't know who these who you guys are until you go inside your soul and, and pull it out of you. It's not that it's not very hard. And I just think it's it, I think that while there is more uh, out there today and there's more freedom, I almost think that we're saturated with too much and we're so interconnected that there's no opportunities for that regionalism, those hotbeds of music to cultivate and then snap all of a sudden, you know, people walk in and say, I had no idea this was going on over here. So, I mean, you know, when I interviewed Zakir Hussein, he said, he goes, we became totally interconnected much faster than we had to. So I, I, I my only thing is like, I, I just find that there to be clearly a supply and demand issue. You talk about going to places in Kansas City for a week. Uh, there, the, you know, there's one jazz club left in, in Southern California, so there's no places for people to play, even if they have chops. And then, and then you have uh, sort of a, an identity crisis. Unless you are living off, you know, and rightfully so, a career that includes Van Morrison and Maria Moldauer and Bonnie Raitt and John Mayall and and then people say, oh, Freebo, you know, they get, but for younger cats, not having the ability to create an identity, uh, I would never know about you guys without, without LPs. Well, well but, but, and, and I hear what you're saying. Yeah, and, and yes, I'm, I'm fortunate to have some of that history, and, and that has helped me get a foot in the door. That's about it. Uh, after my foot's in the door, uh, I still got to show up with the goods. Okay. <laughs> I got to show up with the goods. And, and, and that, that's, that's been a very valuable lesson for me, and it's really made me go back into the woodshed and get better and better at what I do in my craft. Yeah, right, right of, on. Uh, of yeah. songwriting, of singing, of entertaining, the whole thing. For the young kid, though, uh, yes, he doesn't have the machinery to put him out there. However, he talked about the record. Yes, it's nice to have a, a real album where you you look at the thing you can see, you can feel the person, you can get a little information, it's all right there, you pull out the record to put it on. Beautiful stuff, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, it's incredible. However, uh, what we do have now is you have the little CD and you can't put a whole lot of information on there and uh, it is what it is or you download it too. However, we do have websites and things like that so that if you do happen to hear that song and download it and have any interest whatsoever, and I think that's where it's come to, it's become much more individualistic to where we have to do the work. And that's the beauty of the internet. Uh, if you just listen to corporate news, that's what you'll get. But if you want to go a little bit deeper, there's a million places you can go. You know, you can go to websites that are complete BS, or you, but, but the way to find out where the BS is to go to a bunch of them. And ultimately, your own intuition is going to tell you. I'm obviously preaching to the choir. You know that. But but the fact is, is that, that information is there. You don't have to go to a big set of encyclopedias. You just go to Google. You can really check your things out. So uh, for the young kid, uh, he can create a website that talks all about his history, talks about his political beliefs, his economic beliefs, his, his view of the world. Uh, and, and then here's a song that talks about that. So he can really paint in a way, a much more complete picture of him or herself uh, than what maybe what the record company might have done. And he can even be a little bit more honest because he doesn't have to worry about, yeah, we better be careful to say this, we might screw up the, uh, well, let, let's keep a teeny bop, okay, we don't want to say anything too intelligent. Right. Because, uh, so, uh, again, I, 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 you know, the, the times were the times, and, uh, you know, I could sit in, in regret and lament, uh, but, but, you know, I mean, it is 2013, and I am who I am, and I am the age I am, and I have behind me what I have behind me. The future, who knows what it is, but I do have the present moment, and uh, and all I can do is make the best out of that, and uh, and figure out a way to again to make the best music I can make, and then figure out a way. And for me, that's <laughs> that's the hard part, is the marketing of it. This is the part I don't particularly enjoy, but I enjoy things like this. Don't yeah, well, no, I mean, also, it's like, it's, it's it, you know, it shouldn't be something that's natural, because you're an art, I mean, you're not, it, it's similar to me, I mean, I'm doing my own art after, you know, 300 uh, interviews, I'm putting my point of view up on my website through the words of you guys, and, and in some ways, what's really interesting... And, and you're taking charge, and you're doing exactly what you're taking charge of your own destiny, you can't sit around and wait for a corporation to come along and say, hey, Jake, you know... No, no, absolutely not, I mean, you it's... Have to, <laughs> you have to create, you have to create 
your own job. And unfortunately, that's what's come to now. Yeah. And you have to figure out how do I do this within this corporate world? And I think every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So just like uh, the reaction to AM was FM, the reaction to commercial was the underground in the 60s, uh, the reaction to the, to the pro-America, pro-war Vietnam War was the, uh, was the war protest. Um, the reaction to the short hair and the crew cut was a long hair. So you've got some reactions now coming from people who are really starting to see it was the, the whole uh, 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 the Wall Street thing, I can't think it was called, the, the sit-in thing, what was it called? Uh, with the recent one? or the, or was Yeah, the recent one, the, the, all, the, all the protests of people who camped yeah, well, out. Yeah, Occupy Wall Street, yeah. The Occupy, yeah. yes, exactly, the, the whole Occupy movement, which, again, is, is probably not going to develop into what it did back then, because unlike the Vietnam War, where there's a draft, people don't have a personal stake in it. But more and more people are beginning to have a personal stake because they're start, starting to see this economic system is not working for them. So you're going to see more of that coming out in the art, in the music. The system, as it always does, is wants to maintain the status quo because it's working for them. You know, so, I'll tell you. Yeah, I mean, you, have this in- you have this interesting battle going on once again. It's the same battle that's been going on since the beginning of, of uh, again, in, in people's history in the United States since uh, you know, America started forming. The same thing over and over again. It's just at a different level now. So uh, I think those of us who care have to, you know, put our money where our mouth is and, and, and stand up for what we believe in and figure out where, when, and how to protest and make a difference because it's not the same thing. You know, it's not as easy to get a million people out on the street. And when you do, it's not going to be covered. They're going to say, oh, there were thousands of people on the street. There weren't thousands, there were a million, for God's sake. Yeah. But they don't want to say that because, then it, so this, again, the status quo wants to protect itself. So I think you pretty much have to start from that that place and, and go from there. Yeah, you know, it's funny because it, the it's easy for me to look at this earlier time and, 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 and fantasize about it as, as if it was some euphoric thing, but um, in actuality, there were real legitimate uh, causes. Uh, although, you know, j- black jazz music, really, there was not a lot of correlation with the civil rights movement, per se, but yeah, I think the Vietnam War seeing friends, uh, and also just the the, 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 um, the inequality gap was not, there was a real middle class and there were wealthy, yes. you know, there were wealthy people, but you have basically a working poor, uh, a bunch of individuals like myself sort of sitting on the outside, educated, not playing the game, and then just a filthy, and then a bunch of young people in debt, and then just several, hun- several hundred thousand, maybe, yeah, just several hundred thousand very wealthy, soulless people who were, you know, the status quo, and and that was that was a different thing because back then there was it was you got you had guys from the neighborhood coming home, and your town was a perfect example. Uh, I guess you were just young enough to to miss the. Were you young enough to miss the draft? How did that work out? Oh no, no, no! I was right. You were right in the mid. Did you actually? No, I, oh my! No, God. I no, I, I I got out of it. I uh, oh, wow. uh, I, I there's no way I was going to go in, and uh, you know I I did it with uh, I, I exaggerated allergies and asthma to the nth degree. I was very yeah, good for you. That was smart. Ridiculous, but I had, <laughs> and, and if that wouldn't have worked, uh, I would have pulled an insanity bit. I, I had no quarrel, quarrel with the Vietnamese. I knew it was wrong. Um, I knew the conscience subjector wasn't going to really get me anywhere, so I. I just knew that uh, I had to find some way of getting out of this, and I had no guilt then, and I have no guilt now. I've got great compassion for the soldiers who went, uh, either willingly or unwillingly. I've great compassion, uh, and uh, you know, they, uh, I've, I've got a, a, a beautiful song of mine. It's called "A Soldier of War," that, that, that deals with all that. Wow. And, uh, it basically, essentially, based on Ron Kovic and his story. Sure, born on the 4th of July, yeah? Yeah, he was born on the 4th of July and, and became you know, one of the great anti-war spokesmen of all time. Uh, and he, he went, I mean, he, he, re, he enlisted originally for Vietnam, and then he re-enlisted. And that's when he got uh, got blown up and became paraplegic. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, the movie, I've read the book, and, and that the scene of uh, the conditions of him returning to the institution in Queens uh, when he's first sort of 
uh, getting back into uh, or being quote unquote re rehabbed, and the place is full of uh, you know rats and mice, and it's just you know it's it's it was. But the point is that 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 there were towns in eastern Pennsylvania or a blue collar Long Island where I'm from, where you know if I was if when you you were you had buddies who went off and didn't come back, and that to me was a massive rallying cry. And um, and then of course you had this whole thing going on where I and I still haven't done enough research on it, but it just. I gather that the riots occurred because civil rights in, in the minds of many uh, African Americans was not moving fast enough. So then put that into the mix as well, and you already have these sort of you know anti-establishment or you know non-conformists, uh, and you have this what, what occurred really during the early 1970s, which is this cross. And Bonnie Raitt is a really an amazing example of it is that I, I mean, I can look at her albums, all the ones that you're on and, and, and she's bringing in, you know, I mean, you know, George Bohannon and Oscar Brashear and Dave Holland, all these guys who were known for their jazz chops, but yet they're coming into her and, and, and adding colors to her album. And I just, to me that for, there was, there was some flexibility during that time that, that is just, it's just almost intoxicating for me. No, I, that, I mean that, that's really that, that's what I wanted to say was that the, the 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 ability of to to bring in all sorts of guys who could play, and you'd look at certain albums. I mean that that Buddy Guy album that that on Vanguard that you're on, uh, hold that hold that plane. It's, I think Barry Atchel is on drums, and I, I'm like, this is they're thinking progressively. They're thinking they're thinking outside the box. Well, and, and you know, and that's part of the hybrid thing. I mean that that had to happen eventually. Because it's not like Dave Holland can only play jazz. He's a musician. <laughs> so, you know, that's right, he played right. you know, bass on Give It Up and you know, on the song. And, uh, and you know, I played tuba on it. It was it was perfect. It would call for an upright bass. I didn't play upright bass. He played great on it. It sounded really cool. It really, really swang. <laughs> yeah. Swung. And, you know, and then I put the tuba part in and it turned a whole different vibe. And, and uh, yeah, it's like, hey, why not? You know, uh, I mean, you listen to uh, uh, you know some jazz stuff. There's some pretty funky stuff, and some of that jazz stuff. Ron Carter, you know, some interesting stuff. Uh, Ray Brown, not quite as much, but Ray Brown was an influence, by the way. Ray uh, Brown, I, I mean, mind. Ray freaking Brown. That dude is. Uh, he, he might be the best. Not, I mean, the chops were there, but just the ability to come in and at whether it was a soundtrack or or whether it was like. Uh, Anything, I mean, it, it's it's incredible to listen back any of the Quincy Jones stuff, and you're like Ray Brown. Just, I mean, he he would put himself inside. And you're right, that's a really good point. It's not just jazz. You're, but you you were you're a musician. I just feel now with uh, there's an imbalance between street learning and academia, and the ability for you guys to have all that street learning allowed you to be musicians and fit into any, you just nailed, we just figured it out, and now you go to school and you're sort of trained, there's manuals, there's books, I don't think, there, I don't know, there's a Freebo book on bass yet, but there's, you know, there's like, you know, Pat Martino, the great guitar player from Philadelphia, there's books about his, the way he, his, his strategies, his, his writing, I mean, you can comp all this stuff, but yet, the lack of ability to go out and meet different people from different parts of the country and and they were bringing their own styles and it was that street element that allowed you to be real musicians which i think is is harder for musicians today not being one just being a journalist but i mean like there are people that say those a lot of these academic institutions amount to nothing more than chop shops you know some of them well no and you're absolutely right and 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 i think i think you're right i think it ultimately becomes a balance between academia academia and street and uh, it can be achieved either way. I, I think you can you can actually achieve more from the street and get into the academic world just by reading like Abe Lincoln did yeah. than you can by just being in the academic world and trying to go to the street. Because I don't you, you can't learn street in academia, but you can learn academia in the street. So if you find the right combination of those two, I think that's happening. Uh, by the way, uh, I, I don't have a free boat book, but I, I, I am doing some, uh, some base teaching on a website called jamplay.com. Beautiful. And, and uh, yeah, so I've got a series of uh, bass lessons on my content.
concept, et cetera, et cetera. But the thing about uh, about a Ray Brown or, or any of these people doing this is it, it, it all feeds into to what I think is the essence of, uh, of ensemble playing or playing an instrument. Uh, what you're doing ultimately is you're serving the song, uh, serving the piece of music, whether it's uh, Miles Davis going along with that and he'll say, here's the song, and there and then take off and improvise, or whether it's, uh, you know, me playing bass on a Bonnie Raitt song. It's ultimately about the song, which is the melody, uh, the lyric, uh, and the person who's delivering that, the singer. So that's the most important part. And if you, if you think you're the most important part, being any of the other instruments, uh, you know, I would say get out of your ego. <laughs> and the, 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 you're serving the song. So if you're thinking that way, everything that you do is going to be the most you can do to support to support the song. And ultimately, uh, if you know your instrument, uh, you will be focused one-third on your instrument and two-thirds on listening. It's all about listening to what else is going on. And Ray Brown is a great example of that, and I think that's why he got so much work. Yes, he knew his instrument. He had the jobs. He had a great sounding instrument. He knew how to get the tone. Uh, he was probably a really nice guy, so he probably worked his politics really well. But he really knew how to get in there, whether it was Oscar Peterson uh, or, or anybody else, or Ella Fitzgerald, or he knew how to get in there and play just the right thing at the right time, because it wasn't about Ray Brown. It was something uh, it was about something greater than him. It was serving the piece of art, serving the music. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're... <coughs> thing so many leaders of bands, uh, heads of bands, titular heads, whatever you want to call them, uh, Garcia comes to mind as well. When you just, uh, when you are, when the music, when you don't put yourself above the music, and when you're listening to what other people are doing and saying, no, you're playing that minor seventh? Yeah, I'm going to go over and do that too. I mean, you're tra- I mean, what you're doing is you're, you're fueling this, this completely, the flow, the flow, the organic flow of, of love and, and, and how music is supposed to be, which is listening. And I think that that is another, we've come across, I'm going to have to go back and listen to this because it's going to really work with my dissertation very well, but it's like, you know, we're, we're, we're focused here on listening and you guys had the AM radio, you had the ability for you to create fantasies in your head based on what you were hearing and, 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 and listening was a much larger component to uh, the idea of music, and I, I think it just fits into the va- the value system now um, of of the ego being much not being too insecure to listen because somehow you're going to miss the boat or you're not going to be the number one guy or you're not going to be the lead player. You look at a lot of things right now. You know, you got Snoop Dogg up front, and you got all these great instrumentalists way in the back, and that's kind of the other thing that I've explored here is this this whether it was Duke Ellington or or, or Oscar Peterson or or any of these these brilliant cats, they 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 knew they at one time like yourself were accompanists, and they valued the accompanists because the work of the accompanists colored the rest of the music. In that again is is almost it doesn't it doesn't resonate today. It doesn't seem like there is that. At least it's not you know at least it's it's not as apparent to me. Again, I'm, I could also be accused of being in a complete time warp. So I mean, but but I, I no, I, no I, I agree with you. It's it's really about about the stars, about being a star, you know, Star Search, uh, American Idol, uh, The Voice, it's, uh, and, you know, uh, getting into the NBA, and getting in there, is like how many points do you score? Uh, you know, how, what, how high were you in the draft to the NFL? I mean, it, 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 the, whole, the whole system, is, and, and again, the narrative is based on we're number one. So if you're not number one, you're number two, it's not, wow, that's great, you're number two, God, boy. Look at all the number two out of thousands and millions. No, the only thing that matters is number one. That's right. And, 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 and so I, I, I think the, the whole the whole thing is off. Is that, uh, it, it, it's all about you know winning. And I, again, I think it's in our politics. You know, God forbid we should admit that we lost the war, or that we made we made a political blunt, or we made a mistake. Uh, and, and that gets into personal work. You know, uh, into a lot of personal work. I mean, I, you know, I. I love the work of that Cartole because he really deals with the ego. Well, I don't, you know, okay, I don't know. Yeah, no, this is, you do have, on your website, you do have a, a, a link to your spiritual. Uh, yeah, and I need to really, uh, I need to really, you know, follow through on that and, uh, you know, get a lot deeper with that because, uh, 
you know, and I'm not talking about religion, I'm, you know, I'm talking about spirit, which is a whole different thing, you know. Well, we're, we're, no, we're, we're, we're on the same, I mean, you know, I just, it's intergenerational uh, uh, situation here, which is why this program is, is so scintillating and, and why I'm actually, uh, you know, like we talked about the internet before, uh, one, one of the great advantages for me is, you know, being able to find you guys because of websites. There you go. You know, I mean, you would not have been able to do this with a, with, you know, with a, with a payphone, with a, with a nickel or a dime, you know, I mean, you know, you, you couldn't have done it back in the day. So, I mean, I, I feel, you know, like I just interviewed Cedar Walton, who I guess, you know, was, it could be considered in the land of giants with train and bird and, and, and some of those guys are still with us, but a lot of them are, are gone now. John Lee Hooker, Chuck Berry, uh, Bill Monroe, uh, but yet the, your generation. Well, wait, is Chuck Berry died? Is he still around? I thought he was. God, I hope. <laughs> okay, I'll take that back. Haven's Haven's past, but but the idea is that the, the, your generation, uh, you know, that you were able to be, you were you were really the uh, second generation, and you were able to learn from these masters and became musicians. Like you clarified it before, you were able to fit into all different musical settings, and I feel that aside from your continued creative um, efforts, uh, you know, this forum is an opportunity to send out this type of. Uh, you know, long format uh, interview um, for younger generation. I think you guys are, are, it's imperative that you guys build a esoteric and intellectual bridge to the future because you guys, it's, you're being totally authentic because that's how you lived. And, with, and you guys aren't getting any younger. And that's one of the major reasons I've just been adamantly going about doing this um, is, is just the idea of being able to spread wisdom and knowledge to really younger generations who are growing up with even less listening skills and less emotional skills. You want to you want to talk about why some of these mass killings are happening and they the, the, the kids the kids are they're they're void of emotion because of, of the digitization. And and that is you know that is scary and that is something that I being that I have, I had a little bit of a taste of it for some reason at 35. Still, I had that. I have that old soul to begin with, but I was also reared under guys who were able to see, uh, you know, when, I'm, you know, in in what I'm doing, I know is essential for those who yearn to learn more. And I think you guys, your generation, wanted that. I think you guys wanted to learn more, and you weren't spooked. You weren't going to be out psyched by some sort of, you know, slogan or trend line or being number one. Uh, your your educations were invaluable, and now the combination of, you know, the corporatization, the dumbing down, and also the sort of this within the youth, uh, this sort of uh, void of emotion, void of emo- almost yeah. void, is scary to me. No, it's a very interesting point, and I hadn't quite put it, uh, it but I, I think you nailed it. Um, void of emotion that you may as well have a crack addict or you know a speed freak a meth addict right because that's exactly what happens it takes, takes the emotion you know out which is you know that, that's our spirit and when that's gone I mean you can do anything you can kill anybody do whatever I hate it's what I feel like doing so I'm going to do it I don't care you become a sociopath and you don't, and if you live in a virtual world, if you haven't had a regular conversation with your folks in six to ten years, and you live in a virtual world, it's not going to really, it's not going to resonate, it's not going to mean anything. It, it, it's, and that to me is, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a parental breakdown in the country, um, and obviously a, a values issue, but I mean, you know, really at the end of the day, uh, you know, just to be able to glean this stuff from you and talk to you and get a perspective from it. Uh, we haven't even played any music yet. So, I mean, I know you're going off to Israel Freebo. Uh, is that, is that a, is that for, uh, is that a musical venture or talk a little bit about oh, that? Oh yeah, no, it's definitely a musical venture. I'm not playing at a festival called the Jacob's Ladder Festival. Beautiful. And, uh, I'll do a couple of house concerts and I'm, uh, doing some teaching, uh, at a school called the Ramon School, R-I-M-O-N. It's like Ryman, but it's Ramon. And uh, they're affiliated with the uh, with uh, Berkeley School of Music in Boston. So uh, that's another phase of, uh, of what's going on with me. I'm, I'm really excited about this, this the teaching because it's something I never planned on doing. But it turns out over the years I've been able to, you know, pick up a couple things and learn a few things. 
colleagues, and now I can take uh, whatever you know wisdom I've been able to accumulate, you know, or um, experience. Uh, I can now pass that on, as it's been passed on to me. I can pass it on to somebody else in my own particular hybrid, in my own particular way. You know, when you do that, it's a wonderfully satisfying feeling. So um, I, I find that I'm, I'm operating in a bunch of different worlds now. In that world, in the spiritual world, I take my music to some progressive churches, you know, some of the thought churches, you know, a unity, uh, science of mind, uh, just now call Centers for Spiritual Living. Um, Unitarian, and uh, I've got that, and uh, uh, play sometimes I play in the Jimmy Buffett world. Those people seem to really like my songs. Yeah, right. right. And they don't have to be dog songs. They love them when they like one of my really you know, deep, sensitive songs, and you relate to it, and they go, cool. You know, and then, uh, you know, I've got, uh, uh, when I get back to play the bass, uh, I sat in with some folks in New York. I was in, in the city uh, about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, and uh, uh, I was invited to come and sit in uh, at this club called 78 Below. And you know, some, of, some of the best uh, session players in New York, kind of Johnny Rosh on keyboard, great singer and uh, harmonica player, and uh, Jerry Marotta on drums. Uh, uh, he actually played a couple of cuts on my record, but Jerry played with Peter Gabriel. Oh, sure, sure. Paul McCartney, a whole bunch of folks. And a uh, wonderful guitar player named Mark Schulman, just one of these guys who just plays all the right stuff, you know. Just plays all the right parts. It's not about ego and ask him to blow. He's a great solo player, but you know, just really wants to play the right stuff. And a great, great bass player. Frank was playing bass, but very graciously allowed me to come up and bring my bass. And so I played like five, six songs, and, and it was just so cool. I mean, I don't play the bass that much anymore because I'm focused on guitar and singer song or anything. But it's like getting back on the bike, and it's just such a pleasure and honor to play with just great musicians and just be part of it and just fit right into the groove and help create the groove and go with it and uh, you know I mean it, it wasn't about the money there was no money it just just brought me just complete joy and uh, so to be able to get to this point in my life in my 60s where I can take this hybrid that I am and all this experience that, that I have in, in so many different realms including you know the old football player and all this other stuff and, yeah. you know uh, the, the you know the deer hunter country and, and, and put it all together and, and be able to to bring joy to other people and, and create joy within myself is um, I gotta tell you Jacob it's such a blessing well no, you, you know you, like you call, call up out of the blue and just say hey man I want to talk to you about who you are what you've done I mean it's uh well, uh, we're, we're 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 locked in for part two. I, I I I this was we went for about an hour hour almost an hour and a half. So we, we'll we'll when we pick up part two, we'll we'll be in the studio. And we're going to listen to some tunes and we'll uh, and, and we'll break it down even farther. But I, I you know the reason that 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 you you are blessed and you are cultivating and continue to grow is because. Um, you're very down to earth and uh, you are who you are and you're and you treat everybody the same way and um i think that you're reaping the benefits from being yourself so i would just say keep being yourself i don't think I, you need to be told that but that to me is the the crux of it is that uh so many times in our society now if you're not number one then you're not nothing at all and people are people are, are too psychologically soft to um to rebut that but that's the truth and and with you you don't maybe you were number one number 24 in the draft traded down for a third round pick it didn't matter you just have continued to be yourself love hum, hum, you know humility spirituality finding the groove and uh you know and look where look, look, look where it's continuing to take you so have a great trip and uh and and when you come back we'll uh, we'll link up and do part two Hey, you too. Safe trip, Freebo. All right, thanks, Jake. Take care, brother.